So welcome to a new series on my channel where I'll be doing a deep dive into some of my productions over the years. I'll be talking a little bit about the thinking behind the tunes when they were created and going into a bit more detail on the production side, so opening up um, Ableton files and diving into the techniques and thinking behind how the track was put together. So the very first track that I'm going to work on today was a huge undertaking. It's something that I'm pretty much just finishing up now. Um, it's Lunatic Calm, Leave You Far Behind. Now, this was a track that was actually written way, way back in the mists of time. This was originally written in 1995. And at the time, it was it was right at the end of my previous band, Flicker Noise. We were experimenting with music that was more dance orientated. Flicker Noise had been more of a kind of rap rock hybrid affair, um, hinting at some electronic stuff, but by and large going a bit more down the kind of Rage Against the Machine style avenue. And one of the many experiments we were we were trying out at the time was this track called Leave You Far Behind. And I recently found, I think, what's the earliest prototype version of the track um, on an old DAT tape. Now, this hasn't been remastered or anything, um, but I found a couple of older versions of this track just to kind of illustrate the different steps that it went through before it reached the final version that appeared on Metropole and on a whole bunch of movies and all the rest of it. Um, these I won't. I, they haven't been played anywhere before. Nobody really has heard these demos. They're very rough around the edges. They were written around the time when we were just starting to get to grips with sampling. We just bought a whole bunch of stuff for a studio where we had a 32-channel Mackie desk for the first time. We were using um, S3000s. We had two S3000s and an old S1000 Akai samplers. Um, we had a few keyboards that included the Korg Prophecy. We had a, a Juno, an SH-101. We had a Supernova, which we used for quite a few of the pads and strings on our tracks. Um, I can't remember what else. I think that was that was largely it on the keyboard front. Um, and then we had a whole bunch of sort of outboard effects and bits and pieces. But effectively... Everything really revolved around the samplers with a few live keys played over the top. So let's just have a listen to the original Flicker Noise prototype of Leave You Far Behind. And it's astonishingly different from where this track ended up. in around here somewhere. Definitely the uh, supernova there on strings, I reckon. So the track then underwent a few other iterations like there was an experimental kind of 140 beats per minute sort of acid version um, there were various other versions that cropped up 
And then as we started making the Metropole album in the early months of 1997, um, we kind of settled on a on on a different version of Leave You Far Behind that was much more kind of in keeping actually with the uh, Luna 6 roller coaster mix, I think, which was the, the version that appeared on The Matrix. Um, although this is it's much longer than the final kind of single version that appears on the album and much less kind of grungy. But um, this, and this has been remastered from the original Dats, but this was the original Lunatic Calm kind of prototype version. See how it's don't need no sympathy. Don't need you looking out for me. Yeah. I wanna take you on a roller coaster. So some lyrics there that don't need no sympathy, which doesn't entirely appear on the original. So that, that line was cut, but what's quite interesting is when I was digging into all of these vocal parts, there is a little vocal snippet down here that I had no idea quite where that was coming from. And it sounds like this. I didn't really know where that was from, but that's actually the word sympathy reversed. So that formed part of this like well of um, creative data that we had as the part of the, the um, original prototype of Leave You Far Behind. Let's just have a quick listen to how that sounds as we move into the breakdown in the middle. Really like those string chords like there. A different vibe to it all around it's got much more sort of dance floor feel to it really it's less punky um just a very different deal and actually we didn't change to this final version if i remember rightly until almost the day that the album was getting mastered we had a long conversation with the record company and our management and everybody felt that the one thing the album was really missing was a sort of surefire radio track um, and we really weren't into that idea at all. I mean, we didn't really hear music in that way. We just wanted to make killer tunes that um, that we were happy with. And we felt the album was pretty well balanced. So the original Leave You Far Behind kind of had that, that much more groove-orientated feel to it. Um, so when we came back to it, we almost... There was an element of, like, just fuck it. Let's, let's just turn everything up to 11, cut anything out that sounds too um emotive and too musical really and just go for it and so we 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 did that we didn't i don't think we recorded any of the vocals again i don't think we re-recorded anything we just literally rearranged the track made it much more compact and much more sort of punishing and i remember the mackie desk we had at the time was 
Uh, it was a 32 channel, eight bus Mackie, and it had this amazing distortion on on the on the channels. So if you just ramped up the gain to to 10, um, and then fed particularly acid parts through it, but also vocals sounded pretty good and drums as well. You could get this really kind of warm saturation by doing that. And I just remember having all of these channels just completely overloaded, and then we were taking the master volume down on each of them to make them actually balance and this is the version that you'll know from Metropol um, this is how it kind of ended up So, you know, there have been a lot of things that have kind of bugged me about this track over the years, to be honest. I mean, it has totally outperformed itself. It's been used in 20 or 30 different movies and TV shows and um, video games, etc. And it, and it really has, it's, it's been far and away the most played and listened to and licensed track of anything that we did over the years. But it always bugged me on the production side because whilst we... We did really know our way around the S3000s and the samplers and the keyboards, and we were both pretty musical. So we we had we had a lot of um, sort of musical chops at our disposal to make things interesting and to make string lines really dramatic and emotive and all the rest of it. So we knew what we were doing, kind of in the programming side of things, but in the production side, we really didn't fully understand how to make great sounding records and we did the best that we could but the room that it was recorded in was a spare room in the house that I was living at um, in Camberwell in London at the time uh, like an end of terrace Victorian house and we just had this room that had no acoustic treatment in it whatsoever we had a pair of Mackie 8R, um, HR824 monitors which I actually still have in the studio today although I don't use them all that often and uh, a pair of NS10s, I think, Yamaha NS10s. But there was no acoustic treatment. There was no real understanding of translation and how mixes need to translate to any system outside of the system that you're working on, in the room that you're working on. And for those of you that don't know too much about room acoustics you know every room that you play music in colors the sound sometimes hugely like the room that i'm in here is another spare room in the house that i'm living in and it's pretty much a cube which is one of the worst possible situations you can you can have sonically because you get like a sound comes out of speakers and bounces off walls if all the walls and ceilings are all equidistant from each other then you get these huge kind of boosts of frequencies at certain parts of the room and you can walk around the room and all of a sudden a bass frequency will just become absolutely deafening so you know we had no real understanding of that and how to kind of compensate and there was nothing like sonar works reference which is something that i use now on speakers or these headphones, and I, I use the um, all these LCD Xs, which are fantastic, and do a much better job actually sonically than pretty much any room treatment I could come up with in a in a space like this. Um, but back then we just we didn't we just didn't know any better, so we just we just made the music and. Um, and now if you kind of come into these tracks with much more of a critical ear, like you can hear, for example, uh, if you listen to the exposed bit of bass at the beginning and just really concentrate on the bottom end of that bass, that bottom end was what underpinned this entire track. And yet it's hugely inconsistent. Like you can, because it, it comes from multiple different takes on a super cheap bass guitar and the strings were really buzzy and really... I mean, it was like a we borrowed it off a mate and the strings were really old and they were frayed, but we kind of liked the way it gave this really rough edge. But as you can hear, some of those notes are actually spun backwards. 
they all come from different samples, from different takes. And as a result, that subsonic bass, the real kind of the warmth and the, the, the thing that actually underpins the track simply isn't there. It's really inconsistent. <laughs> And then if you listen to the acid there as well, and if I put in a little EQ here on this channel and then bring up the EQ. So when you see this acid line coming in here, you're going to notice a whole ton of like sub bass stuff going on. <laughs> Now, all of that information is within that acid line and it runs throughout the entire track, basically. So all that's doing is it's effectively muddying up and making the bottom end really unclear in the track. And that's something that's kind of replicated right across the track on that sample, but on pretty much every other sample we use. So we have three main drum loops. They're all dirty as hell. Uh, they're not compressed properly. They They have you know nasty little kind of artifacts happening they have little spikes like little treble spikes um in the kind of upper mid-range and all of those things go together as you as you piece more and more layers of sound together to create a piece of music all of them start kind of compounding on top of each other until you just end up with something of a muddy mess and whilst you know, you could take that in to be mastered and the mastering engineer would do their best to simply remove the muddy frequencies within the mix. They don't really have any control over the specific mix down. That's done by us. That's done by us in the studio. Um, so if we weren't really aware of those techniques, you're never going to get the most sort of faithful um, sound. And the, the whole thing is just going to going to come across as extremely rough around the edges. And I totally get why that's part of Leave You Far Behind's appeal. It is really rough around the edges. But what I decided to do earlier on this year is I just decided to come back to the track and try and recreate it. And I've never, I don't think I've ever done this before with anything that I've written. Um, I tend to be very focused on the future rather than looking back on the past. Um, leave you far behind, if you will. Um, but um, I, I amuse myself. Um, but anyway, so like the idea of leave you far behind was coming back to it. It's like I wonder if there's a way that I can come back to this track and simply give it the production that I feel that it deserves using some of the techniques that I now have available to me. Um, so it, it really was a bit of a labour of love coming back to it. The, the biggest problem initially was that you see this folder on the right here. This was literally all I had to go on. So back then, I believe we were working on a very, very primitive version of Cubase for all of our production with a brand new Apple Mac of some kind, a very, very basic Apple Mac. But back then, you didn't work in audio at all. You just wrote in you had a big daisy chain of MIDI instruments and they all kind of linked together. So all the computer was doing was, it was just sending out the zeros and ones of the MIDI information and telling the keyboards and samplers what you wanted them to to play. So um, so we didn't really have any, any of the flexibility. Everything, all of the editing was done within the um, S3000s and this is the only information that we had left. We had none of the MIDI sequences. We had none of the live performed stuff because we used to just record these things, these mixes, these mix downs were just recorded live to tape. So we'd have all, we'd have everything kind of daisy chained. We didn't have a multi-track tape. We just had a DAT tape. So at this point anyway. So what we'd do is we'd just have all of the samples. We'd have all of the equipment daisy chained and then we'd just do a live performance of it. And um, and a lot of the acid parts as well were simply done live, um, just to give them that kind of real real human element. But none of the acid parts, unfortunately, were recorded. So whilst we did have we did have a few little bits of um, of Nord, the only Nord stuff I could find in these original parts were a couple of tiny little rhythmic motifs, which didn't really add up to much. 
Um, and I no longer have a, a sort of working version of the Nord lead that we recorded the acid parts on. So that was a big problem. But the biggest problem is that the original Akai files that I had are all the Unix um, executable files. And I must have spent at least a day trying to source um, programs that would convert these into a usable form of um, information that I could, I could you know, run in Ableton. Couldn't figure it out at all. Tried a bunch of different stuff. None of it worked. And then eventually, just out of frustration, I went into one of these parts and I just typed in um, dot .wave at the end and hey presto, it once again became a um, a wave file. Once became you know once again became an audio file. So then, because I didn't have the program parts for um, the, these these sp dot sp um, document files were the Akai programs, and that's where all the kind of detailed work was done, where the samples were repitched, maybe where they were, um, you know, edited in a different way, whatever it might be. Um, but without those, all you have is those kind of original audio parts. So what I had to then do is go back to basics with them and get them into Ableton and just start figuring out how that sort of jigsaw of sample information slotted together. Um, so bearing all of that in mind like the first thing i looked at i think was the was the main base and given what we already know about it that it was pretty untamed and very very messy what i decided to do with the base was to to effectively create a sub base to underpin our baseline which meant that i could take out some of the very kind of bottom end out of the base, which I've done with this EQ. So I've put in um, a low cut filter here around, it's around about 64 hertz. And what that does is it just lo it just takes out some of that swampy confusion that's going on at the bottom. And I'm just pulling down whenever these sort of bottom notes happen here as well, I'm just pulling down a little bit of the um, lower frequencies, and that that just helps with bringing out some of the some of the kind of clarity and some of the top end. It just loses a little bit of mud from that verse. So if we listen to the two basses together, and that's all the sub bass is doing. It's just purely a sine wave sub bass with some compression. So um, so then the other area I looked at is the chorus. And that was a little bit difficult to figure out because it's it's you're effectively working from this original here. So the next step with the bass, when I was happy with how all that was sitting together, I then looked at some additional synth bass information because I didn't want the I did I did do some experiments with the bass where I also had this like additional channel which was like um which was a stereo channel. So I just took some like a, a much more a much less bassy version of the bass and used it as a stereo channel to really pad the sound out at certain points. So here it is with the in. And I quite like the way that sounds when it's isolated, but when you put it in with all of the rest of the kind of cacophonous nonsense that's going on in this track, it just was a little bit too much. So in, in order to, to still give the bass a little bit of punch, I looked at these synth basses here, and particularly the stereo source synth, which sounds nothing at all like a bass. But what it does alongside the um, the bass is it just creates this kind of 
this width, which is what I was looking for really from, from the overly compressed and very high pitch version of the bass here. So I got to that point and I was fairly happy with the way that was all sounding. That one of the biggest issues as well with the original was, was without doubt the drums. And um, I knew something needed doing with those. I've got all the original drums here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly play them to you. They've been treated a lot because they were really, really messy. There was no compression on them. Um, individual hits were way quieter or way spikier than others. There were these like nasty little um, spikes, uh, EQ spikes, where some of them had um, tiny sort of resonant filter, you know, frequencies, which I pulled down and just smoothed them all out. So if we just listen to to the loops now, once they've been processed and once they've been kind of flattened out a bit, this is this is how the original loops sound. You might recognise this one from the uh, the second version of Leave You Far Behind I played at the top. It's also used as the main loop on the um, the roller coaster remix. And there was this ride loop, which is thrashy and nasty as hell. And then the loop of fury here. Super nasty. And then there's a an even filthier version of it that I processed down here that comes in just towards the end. Because the thing is with this track is, oh, and, and just one other thing here is this tight loop before I ramble on. And with this loop, if you kind of look at it, like I've done a lot of work with individual hits, so I've split every single transient on the loop pretty much. And I've just taken off the end of this um, this kind of reverb. So in a sense, it's been slightly deverb just to make it a little bit punchier and a little bit sharper because I've, I felt like the original loop that we were working with was a bit washed out. So I wanted it to have a real tightness and a real kind of punch to it. So if we listen now to the original drums as a whole, this is what we were working with. And I really like what those drums are doing. I think they're powerful, which is why I've kept all the original drums in place. But I, what I really wanted to do is I really wanted to give them more punch. I wanted them to cut through without losing that sort of sonic feel that the original had that I think was was so sort of endearing, really. So I added a whole bunch of extra new drums, and this is how the drums now sound. <laughs> without the new drums. And what I feel like they do is they just add a real sort of potency. They they make things cut through, and particularly on the kick front, um, the kicks that we've added here, um, just they just move the track along a lot more. They really cut through the mix and um, really like the effect they have. If you listen to them on their own, like the new drums, they're not particularly exciting. But with the others... And there was a lot of juggling getting all of those different channels to work. You know, we went from three or four drum parts on the original track to now managing 20 drum parts. Um, but they do sit together nicely. They've sort of knitted together well. So I was pretty happy with the way that went. And just playing the new, like these bass parts with the drum parts. <laughs> And 
think that's got a really nice kind of kick to it now. Um, really thumping compared to to what we had before. So let me just mute out a bunch of this other stuff here. And then we can kind of just very quickly AB between the original and what we now have. So this is what we now have. feel that there's no punch at all in those drums other than the sort of initial downbeat of the bar where there's a big kind of subsonic kick but it's just really kind of messy and really really sort of grunged up there in the lower mids whereas this just has I think a lot more kind of punch and what I like as well with those extra kicks is it's just retained a kind of sense of groove that um, that was a little bit lost on that original version but actually going way back to the prototype version. Definitely had more in the way of sort of thump there in the in the bottom end and more of a groove to it basically. So so that was that was kind of salvaged. The other real big big challenge on here were the acid parts because as I said before, you know, we didn't have access to any of the stems. So we didn't have access to the original acid parts. Um, had to recreate them from scratch, new MIDI parts, just trying to figure out how the hell to create a, you know, a similar sound. We did have like a couple of exposed versions of the Acid Riff, which was cool. So we were able to grab those from other versions and use them here. Uh, and they sound, let's just unmute that. So that's interesting why that's don't know why that's gone so low there. It's because that's gone just get rid of that. It's a little stereo thing that I was doing there. It doesn't sound anywhere near as good in mono. So what was happening with this this acid part is because we didn't have any of the program stuff, we couldn't make it squeal and we couldn't make it move around. It was just literally. But it does work well underpinning this that I discovered. And I did a lot of searching around to try and find um, a decent emulation. And the closest that I got was actually this reactor instrument. And just working alongside this original acid loop and trying to get a sound that kind of worked quite well, I came across, well, I programmed this. And it actually sounds really nice when you squeal it up as well. You can hear that just grumbling like hell because it takes up such an impossible amount of um, CPU so I'm gonna just undo that and go back to it being um, frozen because it, it was pretty much unusable plus I've got this horrendously long um, like plug-in chain just trying to tame the sound and make it as as vibrant and keep it as close to the original as possible um, so having found that as well at the end of the track I was just looking for a way to like really push things slightly over the edge as we had on the original, although I couldn't really get exactly what we had on the original. Um, we did have some nice filth going on. And then also created this super squealy end. Again, using the same plugin. So bear in mind at this point, you know, we are heading towards having 50 tracks of audio that we're trying to manage on, on this tune. It is just 
so full of stuff now. I mean, just trying to kind of do the production touches that I wanted to to make it as kind of interesting as possible um, and to make it as fat as possible. It just, just required... Um, just required a lot of work um, let's just talk briefly about these uh, let's talk about the let's talk about the synth drones for a second so the synth drones are like a kind of additional production touch where we have these breakdowns and just really wanted something that kind of comes in that slightly changes the vibe here gives a sense of ominous doom There's a whole bunch of synths that are used to create that effect. One is the Super 8 Saw synth. It's nice. And then we have a Massive X drone. Just pulses slowly. Gives a sense of anticipation. And then a secondary set of bass stabs, which just work alongside these ones, really. Except these are dry no effect on them and then I used a, an Aparillo, Aparillo synth to create this kind of spooky ambient effect that I think works especially well in the central section here what I like about these elements is they all have their place this ambient synth here just kind of sits on top really nicely and just gives this sort of threatening shimmer um and then the vocals and the vocals were were interesting i mean luckily we did have all the original vocals um which were cut up and put into the sampler so we could spin them around like i showed with that sympathy line earlier on however they really didn't sound very good they were you know again poorly recorded there were pops and crackles and um and just the performances could have been better so you know luckily i'm in a position where i did the vocals on the original so i was able to come back to them in my own time and just and just do fresh vocal takes so the entire vocal from start to finish was recreated um and i just wanted to work on the vocal really with um creating some sort of dynamic range so when you first hear the vocal for example um it's it's actually really intimate it's really tightly mixed and it's very very focused in mono and then gradually it expands into stereo as the as the verse goes on i want to tell you that i'm feeling close i want to push it right over the line expanding out push it right over the line the line that you draw when you draw and then we have the uh, the big chorus. I wanna leave you far behind. And then the the area of real interest for me was this middle section. And like like you heard at the beginning when I was playing these old versions, um, there's something there was something I really liked about the sort of string lines that we had in the middle of of these for the breakdown. But we always felt like that was just that was too much. So. I looked at doing something that was different because I felt like the kind of the big orchestral approach just felt like it was simply too much. So instead of that, I went down a totally different avenue and I I explored how it would work to multi-track a bunch of vocals at that point. The idea being is that these multi-tracked backing vocals wouldn't really take the centre stage at all. The idea was that they'd be very much... Um, a sort of receded component that just adds to the the kind of warmth and the epicness of that moment without really uh, standing out too much. Um, but I think it's quite surprising when you listen to them isolated because it's, um, I think there's 16 different vocal takes that go into creating this effect.
And I've actually been doing these kind of vocal harmonies a lot. I've been working on a on an album called When the Shadow Falls, which um, which will be hopefully coming out later this year. And on that album, I've been doing a lot of kind of vocal harmony work, quite often 24 part vocal harmony or 16 part. And um, and I actually think that you know my my particular voice works pretty well when it's like harmonized with it with itself in that way. So if you listen to the effects and and also you know I wanted the BVs here to be processed very differently from the um distorted nastiness of those main vocals so let's just have a listen So that's how that kind of middle section works. I mean, a lot of work went into those vocals. As you can see, we're actually looking at over 40 different vocal parts in total making up um, the vocals. In fact, more than that, more like 50 parts with these uh, I Wanna Wants here for the um, choruses. Um, and then on top of that, there's just one other, a couple of other minor things like the strings, so the strings are really simple on this track and I, I was tempted to do something that was richer and deeper and more emotive and everything but really wasn't necessary at all so it's just that kind of high notes, the anticipation really. Um, there are several kind of big boom kicks which are the kind of things that I'd use for some of my film and TV work these days and kind of trailer work and and then there's a little rave sample as well which um which is really interesting this just seems to work this just seems to work really nicely on the choruses actually and i'll I'll play the whole track as a whole um in a second and you'll be able to sort of hear those like bedding down in there and the final the final part really is guitars and what's really interesting about the guitars on this track is i, I think a lot of people would be under the um, misguided uh, idea, I guess, that um, there are loads of guitars on Leave You Far Behind. There's actually not at all. And Howie had an amazing guitar rig and a great capacity to create really sort of interesting sounds. He had a um, a mutator, which was a non-programmable, sort of crazy filtering device. Um, he also had like an art effects unit with a big floor box and then a bunch of stomp pedals as well. So it was, a you know, creating like doing guitar work for Lunatic Calm was a massively sort of creative part of what we did. And we always had really interesting samples to work with. And, um, you know, I think I think they really come through. They come through particularly on our second album, on the Breaking Point album that I'd, I'd urge you to to check out if you haven't done already um but in this case this is pretty much the extent of the guitar work on this track even though as you probably heard earlier on there are lots of different kind of guitar samples being used in some of those prototype versions <laughs> so that is pretty much the size of it and i'm just going to now play through a little bit of the new version, the 2021 version of Leave You Far Behind. And then I'll come back briefly and just AB a couple of bits so you can kind of really see the differences between the two. Um, this is a like an unmixed version of the track, an unmastered version of the track rather. So um, I can jump into a mastered version of the track just so you can hear what the absolute finished version of it sounds like after I've just played this through. <laughs>
So let's just have a quick listen to this uh, middle eighth section where we have the superstar and those big vocals coming. I wanna, I wanna be like a So let's just have a very quick A-B between the two and you'll notice the huge difference. I wanna take you on a roller coaster. So I've now opened up um, a little mastering project. So this is the new version of Leave You Far Behind that I've been working on the mastering on. And <clears throat> it's a fairly typical kind of mastering chain for me. But this is really when the track kind of comes alive. And what I'm going to do is just roll through little sections of the track. The upper version here that you see is the original master on the Metropole album and the one below is the new version that uh, I've just been walking you through. So here's the original. <laughs> very much a different sound I think that um, that I've gone for on this new version um, but I think it I think it encapsulates the the real sort of energy of the track um, as I always wanted it to sound <laughs>
That's all for this production walkthrough. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, then like and subscribe. Very much appreciated. And, um, you know, if you're on any groups or forums or Reddit pages or discords or whatever and feel that, you know, people might be interested in, in this walkthrough, then um, by all means, point them my way and I'll see you on the next production walkthrough.